Hey, this is Brock Lemires, and we're continuing our study of embedded systems design. We have switched over to the C programming language in this chapter, and in this video, we're going to start looking at timers, and specifically, we're going to, we're going to do an example of a timer overflow interrupt using a clock as the source. Okay, so just as with any peripheral when you're programming in C, you have to do a certain set of steps, except when we use peripherals now, we're almost always going to allow interrupts to trigger when an event occurs based upon that trip peripheral. Okay, so if you think about the way that we program a timer, the first set is you have to set up the timer. So you have to go out and configure the, all the registers and all the bits that you want in order to turn the timer into something that is what you actually are after. Then you're going to use an interrupt. So then you need to enable the timer interrupts. And remember, all the, all the peripherals are maskable interrupts. So you're going to have a local interrupt enable, and then a global interrupt enable in the form of the GIE bit in the status register, but luckily we use an enable interrupt function in C to set that bit. And then we need to create the interrupt service routine that performs the desired task. And when we program in C, we just got to use some specific syntax in order to make sure that that interrupt service routine uh, or initializes the vector table correctly and also is implemented as an interrupt service routine so that it returns from an interrupt as opposed to returning from a subroutine. <clears throat> okay, so let's go right into it. First and foremost, you gotta think about what we were doing. So we are gonna generate a event <clears throat> that will happen on a specific time scale. And what we wanna do is let's trigger a timer overflow <clears throat> every time the timer B0 system overflows when running in 16-bit mode. And, it, and remember what happens here. A timer overflow <clears throat> is where it starts at zero and it counts up to its maximum value and then it rolls back over to zero and continues to count. When it rolls over from its maximum value to its minimum value, a flag is raised and we can use that flag to trigger an interrupt. The 16-bit timer in timer B0 on the MSP430 is by default a 16-bit timer. That means it will count from 0000, 0, 0, 0 up to FFFF and then roll over. <clears throat> in order to have the timer raise the flag when it gets to its maximum value, we need to put its mode into continuous mode. And so we're going to put, we're gonna, we got to configure that. The timer length default is 16 bits. Even though we can change it to 12 bits and 8 bits or whatever, the default is, is, <clears throat> is 16 bits, so we don't necessarily need to do that. But we do need to remember that the way that they want us to configure the timer systems is you first clear out the timer by writing a one to this bit TB clear. Then you set up the counter length if you want, then you set up the mode control if you need, and then this is set up. The next step is to choose your clock source. So you have four clock choices, but on the MSP430 launchpad board that we're using, we are interested in the two internal clocks, A clock or SM clock. In this example, we're going to use A clock. A clock is driven by a 32 kilohertz internally generated signal, and then that can be used to calculate how long a timer overflow is going to happen. We also have the ability to divide down the clock if we would like to get a slower clock, and there's two divider stages, and both can divide by, <clears throat> you know, one up to something, whatever. Uh, by default, they're both at one, so they don't have any impact. In this situation, let's just keep these out, divide by one. That means the clock that reaches TB0, the timer, is actually 32 kilohertz. So now the question becomes, how often will you overflow? Well, the amount of time in a timer system is always calculated by saying the period of the clock multiplied by the number of counts. In this example, the period of the clock is simply 1 over 32K because that is, that's what hits the timer. So every clock period, another count is going to increment. Count, count, count. <clears throat> and then the number of counts for an overflow is 2 to the n, where n is the width of the counter. So if I put 1 over 32 kilohertz times 2 to the 16, that comes out to be 2 seconds. So let's write a program that sets this all up, and every 2 seconds we'll toggle LED1. So this will be a pretty slow toggle rate, but it'll show us that we can set up the timer in C. Okay, so go ahead and let's fire up CCS, and we'll go fire new CCS. And what we're going to do is let's call this, uh, we're programming in C, <clears throat> so let's do C underscore, and we'll call this, let's see here, make sure I name this consistently. Uh, we're going to call this timers, so this will be our timers examples, A clock, 
and then we'll go overflow because that's the type of interrupt we're doing. And then we'll do a clock overflow. Okay, life is good. All right, so there we go. And so now we're off and running here <clears throat> and we'll do our main.c, boom. Okay, so our, our blank skeleton comes in here. I nuke my comment header because I don't like it. And here we go. All right, so first and foremost, let's set up the ports, okay? So set up ports. Now you say, what ports are we setting up? I thought we were doing a timer. Well, remember, we need to uh, drive LED one. So we need to do port one bit zero to an output. So we need to set port one bit zero to an output. We do that by saying the port one direction register, I need to set bit zero. So I do a bitwise or with a mask of bit zero. And that these this register name comes from pound defines in the header file. And the same thing with the mask for bit zero. So if I do that, I get a nice readable thing. Okay, let's go ahead and clear it to begin. So let's do P1 out, and I wanna clear this, and I'm gonna do a bitwise and with a tilde on the bit mask in order to get the mask into the proper form to, uh, to clear a bit. So I'm gonna do that initially, okay? And the only thing left to, to set up on the digital I.O. or the ports is basically I just got to turn them on. So let's do, uh, remember the PM5 CTL0 register. You got to clear. Whenever you say clear, always think and percent equals tilde. And percent equals tilde. That way you will never forget that tilde. That tilde is going to kill you. Lock LPM5. And that is going to turn on GPIO. Okay. So those three little lines of code turn on everything, but you gotta type it in right. <laughs> okay, there you go. All right, now we're gonna set up the timer. So let's set up timer. <clears throat> All right, first and foremost, remember, we're gonna do, we need to write a one to TB clear. So now let's come back here. And this is nice because we get to use all the same register names and bit masks for what we're doing. Okay, for, for or the same from the assembly program. So if I think about this, I'm gonna go TB0CTL. And you go, what is that? Well, remember, that's the timer control register for timer B0. And if you go back to our chapter on timers, the details of this are given in terms of what it, where it is, uh, what bits are in it, and how they're defaulted and what they actually do to the timer. But I know that if I set TBCLR, I am going to reset timer or reset timer. And that was important. TB clear is a bit mask that's provided in the header file. TB0 CTL is a register address that's defined in the header file. And so it becomes very readable. So now what I want to do is let's choose the clock as a clock. And now once again, we're gonna use some descriptive bit masks. So I can do TB0 underscore or CTL. And I do this, I'm gonna do a bit wise set on a mask called TB SSEL underscore, underscore, underscore a clock. Okay, and now look at that, that is readable. That chose, that chose uh, a clock as the source that comes through this first stage multiplexer. So I've chosen a clock and it was pretty readable you know, if you think about it. And now the only other thing that we're gonna do, if you think about what's defaulted, the divider one defaults at one, so let's just leave it. Default, or the divider two stage is defaulted at one, so let's leave that. The counter length is defaulted to 16 bits, which is what we want, so let's leave that. So the only other setting is the mode control. And remember, we gotta put this in continuous mode. So I do TB0, CB0, CTL, and then I do a bitwise, or to set this bit called MC underscore underscore continuous, okay? We're lucking out in the fact that we're able to only do bit sets because it, the way that these, uh, it's, it's really interesting. So the way that these bits happen to be is if you look at this thing, notice that TBS SSEL, it's either zero one or one zero for the two clocks we care about. That means we're able to get away with just doing an individual bit set on a mask that sets the least significant bit. And then if we do SM clock, we're able to do an individual bit set. Same thing over here when I do mode control, it re it comes out of reset at zero, zero. So I'm able to do this bit set right here. Um, and so that's kind of cool. But what's 
what's interesting is once you get to masks that require you to set both bits, you got to go into the header file and look and see if the, it's actually giving you what you think you're getting. Okay, so just a little warning there. And you know what? We're done with setting up the timer. It's it's going. So now all I need to do is I need to set up the timer TB0 overflow IRQ. Okay, so now I'm going to turn on the interrupts. So the first thing I'm going to do is, is do the local enable. TB0 CTL, and I need to set the TB IE bit. Okay, so this is, this is going to be local and local enable for TB0 over low. Once again, this bit, the interrupt enable, is in the TB0 CTL register. That's, that's very handy for us. Uh, and now what I'm able to do is let's go ahead and enable global interrupts. So I'm going to do underscore, underscore, enable, interrupts, or interrupt. And when it turns purple, I know that the compiler or CCS recognizes it. And so now this is enable maskable IRQs. And remember, all peripherals are controlled by the, the master global enable. But you, so you turn them all, you give them all the ability to trigger an interrupt, but only the ones with their local interrupt are going to actually put the flag to the CPU. Okay, now I always want to clear the flag. Okay, so I'm paranoid about this flag. <laughs> I also like doing it here and then copying and pasting it. So I'm going to clear the flag by, I'm thinking clear, so I go ampersand equals tilde. That way I don't forget. And the mask is TBIFG, so I'm going to clear flag. So IRQ flag. <clears throat> All right, life is good. That's pretty cool. And now what else, do we, what are we going to do? Well, you know what we're going to do? Nothing. Main loop. So I'm going to do a main loop that looks like this. While one, done. <laughs> and I'm going to say, you know what? This is my loop forever. Okay, so that's, I did it. So let's let's look at this really quick. So I set up the ports to have LED1 as an output. So this is LED1. Then I cleared it initially. And then I turned on the GPIO, digital IO. Then I set up the timer. I cleared the timer initially. I chose a clock as its source. I put the timer into continuous mode. And now the timer's off and running. Then I enabled the overflow interrupt local. I enabled the global maskable interrupts. And then I cleared the flag. And now I'm sitting here and I'm like, well, now what's left in my program? I am going to now exit the main loop. <laughs> here we go. So this is interrupt service routines. And this right here is where we're going to do our ISR and also initialize the vector table. So here's what we do. Pound pragma. This is now a directive to the compiler that's going to say, you know what, buddy? We need to initialize the vector for timer zero underscore B1 vector. Okay? Now, if you remember, you're like, what in the world just happened? Remember, timer zero has to do with its timer zero B is timer B. And then remember, so it's like the B zero. That's what tells me the B zero. The one has to do with there's remember there's two vector addresses associated with this uh, timer B timer B zero and the one that has the overflow in it is this particular vector okay and so what we do is we found that in the table for uh, the interrupt so if I would look at the table really quick, notice that I come in here and I've got where I'm using timer zero B timer zero and then the B. And the note, remember the three just stands for that there's three compare capture registers, capture compares. So these are the two vectors for that guy. And now you go, which one am I actually using? And it's like, well, it's not CCR0. It's this one, TB0 IFG. This right here is the flag for a timer overflow when you just let it go all the way up to its maximum value and go back. So this vector label is timer0 underscore B1 underscore vector. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, what? Who is coming up with these naming conventions? It seems like they're always changing. And the answer is they are changing constantly. They're, they don't, it's it's not perfect. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. This is the, the answer and you have to just deal with it. <laughs> okay, so back to our program. 
Okay, so we're now we have we to, we have a directive telling the C program or the compiler it's like get ready because I want to go to this vector location and what I want to do is put this starting address interrupt and now that tells it here you comes the next subroutine or routine name that I give you is the starting address to put in that vector so I do a standard C subroutine or routine sorry I keep don't say subroutine void and I'm going to name it ISR underscore TB zero underscore overflow. And then I'm not passing in any variables. And that right there has now opened up. This right now has basically initialized the vector table. Okay. It also tells the compiler that this is a, a service routine, not a subroutine. It's very important because our service routine returns to the main program by only pulling the program counter off the stack. An interrupt service routine pulls both the program counter and the status register. Okay, here we are, what do we do? Well, what do we come here to do? Every time this overflows, I am going to toggle the LED, okay? So I simply do this. So toggle LED one, and that's it, right? Not right. You need to clear the flag because we got in here because the flag was asserted. So we need to clear that buddy out and there we go. Okay, so now let's go ahead and let's compile this and see what kind of typos have been <laughs> made. There's a lot of typing here before one compile. Okay, so we are ready to fire this up and plug in our board. So here we go, here's LED one and I'm just gonna go for it. Okay, I'm just gonna hit run and it's off. It's counting, it's counting, it's counting. Oh, came on. Went off. Came on. <laughs> we did it. Look at this. Okay. So check this out. It's 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 about two seconds, right? So 1001, 1002, 1001, 1002, 1001, 1002. We did it. We did it. That's our first timer in C and it's awesomeness. So that's it. It worked. It actually worked. So every time it overflowed, uh to, using a clock as the as the clock frequency. And uh, going from zero to FFFF, it overflows, fires an interrupt service routine, the interrupt service routine toggles the LED, and then we clear the flag and repeat forever. And the best thing about us is that we're doing it with, with using an interrupt in C, and our main loop is doing nothing but spin. All right, awesome job. You did it. As always, remember, support my channel by subscribing and see ya.